Uh, Galatians 6. Um, I tried to get this on my PowerPoint and for some reason it's not uploading. There's a story out today and you can probably find it. I quit going to Drudge Report here a while back and I go to a website called The Daily, The Liberty Daily. Dot com, the Liberty Daily dot com. And um, there's a story there about Mariah Carey. Do you know who she is? Uh, let me see if I can pull that up on my phone. Her sister um, is suing their mother. Yeah. Uh, blood dripping Mariah Carey's sister claims she saw baby stabbed in satanic rituals as she sues mom for abusing her as a kid. Uh, yeah, there was problems with uh, Dropbox, Michael. I tried to upload, um, I tried to upload um, my sermon a while ago to to refresh it on my tablet, and it wouldn't wouldn't do it for some reason. So I don't know what the deal is. Uh, but anyway, um, if now I don't know if this is true or not, but I will tell you that if you if you don't believe satanic rituals go on in America, they do. They do. Huh? Yeah, big time. Uh, you would think that stuff. Well, I knew. I was good friends with a young man when I was in college. His mother and dad, uh, he grew up in Brazil practically. He spoke Portuguese very well. And, um, and he said they, in, when, when his mom and dad were missionaries in Brazil, they dealt with demon possession a lot. Uh, you would expect that out of a third world nation. Uh, as, and I'll say this, especially anywhere where the Catholic Church has a firm grip on those people, there's going to be Satanism right along, right next to it, and probably right with it. Uh, it's very, very common in Catholic uh, predominant nations that are predominantly Catholic, it's very common for the people to mix their pagan rituals in with Catholic rituals. And whenever they have some sort of mass or some sort of ritual, they will include the name Jesus, Joseph, Mary, they will include those names and also mix it in with other things as well. Um, but Jack Chick put out a uh, sort of a comic book years ago and um, I don't 100% trust his source. Um, I, I think the guy had some problems but I don't doubt that he had a pretty bad, nasty, satanic past. Uh, I knew a guy, and I'm going to mention his name now. He's born again. Um, but when he was in the Navy, he got involved in some pretty nasty stuff. And he described a satanic ritual and uh, a manifestation of a devil. There was a woman on the altar, and... Um, he told me that, that what he saw when this devil manifested, he said it was sort of like burning and eating at the same time. It just consumed this young woman, what, whoever we, she was, however old she was on the altar, so it just consumed her. Now, read your Bible. That stuff happens. It happened in old times. And the Bible says there is no new thing under the sun. It is still going on. And there is absolutely no doubt. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And it's not talking about don't burp at the table and use the right fork. Mannerisms of life, the morals, the rules, your moral compass that guides you Evil communications will corrupt that. And since we're talking about what you, you shall reap what you sow, uh, there in Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And I 
want to strongly encourage. I speak to the parents, but I'm going to speak to young people. Those that are watching, those that are listening. Um, don't listen to that stuff. Don't listen to rock music. Don't listen to rap. Don't listen to country. Don't listen to that stuff. That is sowing things and ideas in your mind. It was bad enough in the 70s. Got a little worse in the 80s. Far worse in the 90s. Now in the 21st century, most, most music is so vulgar and so satanically oriented. Um, it, there are spirits that accompany that music. No doubt in my mind. We know that Satan, in Ezekiel 28, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He was a living musical instrument. And if you think about nature, that makes sense. Birds sing. Uh, various animals make sounds with their body that sort of sound like music. And I'd rather listen to that than rock and roll any day. Okay? But that's how Lucifer was created. With music. And he knows music. He knows uh, how to use music. Um, I read something the other day. I can't remember who it was. One of these rock guitarists from one of these big groups like Megadeth or something like that. And he said, there's no doubt when we would get on stage, we all knew that something just took us over. And that's reported by a lot of rock musicians. When they get on stage, something takes over. And the guy said, it would be nothing for all of us players just out of the blue. Keyboards, guitars, bass guitar... All of a sudden, without, without knowing it, without practicing it, without rehearsing it, without having any thought about it, all of a sudden we would play the exact same riff at the same time. And he said, how does that happen? Something took us over. Um, have you ever heard the name Sasha Fierce? Who is that? Beyonce. Beyonce has an alter ego. She says when she gets out on stage... A spirit takes her over. She, she gives her the name of Sasha Fierce. And she said, it's not me. It takes her over. And there is no wonder that we see the lasciviousness, the drugs, the rebellion in young people. And it's been linked to rock and roll. It's been linked to the music they listen to ever since Elvis Presley first stepped on stage. There were preachers preaching against him all the way back then. And they were right about it. Ed Sullivan wouldn't have him on his show because he was too vulgar in the way that he put himself out there. And so I'm just, just letting you know, I haven't talked about rock and roll music in a long time because I figured most people got some sense. But I'm telling you, young people, I like music. I'm a musician. I like certain types of music. I like music that's very worldly, very worldly. And I have to guard against it. And I'm telling you, it will have an effect on the rest of your life. Can I get some old people to say amen? It will. Um, since we're speaking of sowing and reaping, um, let's turn to Jeremiah 12. I don't quite remember where we left off last uh, Sunday. It was a busy day. We had a lot going on, uh, but it had a good time. Amen. And uh, appreciate the McCartneys. They still hanging around. Can't get rid of them. Don't really want to. So you pray for them. Pray for all of those that have made their way back home. We had we met some met some new people. Just absolutely fantastic to meet. And uh, they left an impression. I know they left an impression on my heart, and I believe they did yours as well. Jeremiah chapter 12, here's what God is saying. This, and he's saying this concerning the churches. Because look at what he says. I have forsaken mine house. Now you think about that. God left his own house. 
God left his own house. Why did he do that? He said, I've left mine heritage. That's like, that's like Michael leaving Kenya and becoming here and then becoming a U.S. citizen. He's left everything he was used to, everything he grew up with, everything he was used to, his old way of life. He left that, walked away from it. I left my heritage. I've given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Look at the language God is using here. He is hurt. He is grieved because his beloved, his espoused bride, Israel, has turned away from... Do you remember the days when you were young and you had your eye on a pretty girl or a good-looking boy and you just, you just knew you wanted them to be yours and they didn't want nothing to do with you? Remember that feeling? Okay? Hated that feeling. Well, that's, that's God here. He refers to them as his dearly beloved. And he's had to give her over into the hand of her enemies. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me. Therefore have I hated it. That is very strong language coming from God. If God says he hates something, you can count on it. Over in Revelation, Jesus said it twice concerning the deeds of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, from what I can gather from that word, Nico means conquer like a king, and the laity are the people in the pews. And God's, Jesus is saying, I hate the deeds of the men, the shepherds, who try to hold power over the pew, who try to rule over them, who try to be their Lord. Okay? He said, I hate that. When, when the clergy thinks that they're elevated up above everybody else. And I got something in my mind to preach about that this morning. But that's what he said. So he says in verse 10, same chapter, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. We know that Jesus in John 15, I am the true vine, ye are the branches. Think about Naboth's vineyard. What did Ahab want to do with Naboth's vineyard? What do you want to turn it into? A garden of herbs, the Bible says. He was going to destroy that vineyard. And remember, in the, in the law that God gave the Israelites, when you were handed a possession by your father, when you were given land that was inherited land, it was to remain in your possession for life. When you died, you were to hand it down to your children. If you didn't have any seed, then a near kinsman could redeem it or your brother was, was, was bound by the law to raise up seed with your wife. But that's how God wanted it. And when Ahab said, Naboth, give me your vineyard. He said, God forbid that I should give you my vineyard. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you a better vineyard. Well, if Ahab has a better vineyard, why does he want Naboth's? Okay? And this is what you hear out of churches all the time. A better translation is this. Now, I like the NIV the way it says this. And this is from a pastor who is trying to transition his church out of the Bible, out of the Word of God. And I do mean out of the Bible, because at some point, that pastor, maybe not him, but somebody who comes in after him, will completely remove that church away from the Word of God. They'll say they don't need it anymore, or they don't trust it. They don't trust how it's translated. They, don't, they believe that it's old, and they, they need something new from God. And I hear this and read this all the time. By the way, did you hear about Jerry Falwell Jr.? Let me give you a little background. Jerry Falwell, years ago, uh, preached the gospel, and he preached the truth out of a King James Bible. And his church grew. He built a Bible college, a Christian school. Started getting into big money. And that money was coming from, um, I would say, questionable sources. 
sources that were not necessarily Christian. That money was coming in. When you get that kind of money coming in and you're doing what, you're, what Falwell was doing, he had TV broadcasts all over the nation. And over the years, he started moving away from the Bible that he once preached out of, as most of them do, started moving away from the morals that he once held to. He's the one on September 12th, 2001, came out and said, this is God's judgment against a nation for killing babies, for sodomy, for, you know, transgenderism, all that stuff. And then five days later, come out and have to apologize for saying that. Why did he apologize? The money. Somebody was going to cut off the purse strings and not give him those large donations anymore, and he caved into it. So when he died, his son, Jerry Falwell Jr., took over daddy's position, and his board now has asked him to step down from the church, from the university, Liberty University, uh, whatever else he's running, and they say it's over a photograph. Now, I've seen the photograph, and it has Jerry Falwell Jr. and a woman that he says is his wife's assistant. My wife has assistants. We call them daughters. But his wife's assistant, uh, standing there, it just doesn't, I won't describe it, it doesn't look good. And he's holding a glass that he swears is, uh, he said black water. I don't know what black water is. Okay, but it's a dark liquid. Okay. So that whole scenario there, I mean, I, I can see them saying, you know what, that doesn't look good. But they've asked him to step down from his position. I think there's more to it. And what's been happening over the last 40, 50 years, 60 years maybe, pastors have been destroying the vineyard. Anytime a man stands behind the pulpit, in front of a microphone, in front of a camera, and tells you that the Bible that your grandfather read, that your great-grandfather read, that our forefathers trusted, that built this nation, that that Bible is wrong and has been wrong and will never be right, and I must correct it, that pastor is destroying the vineyard. He's tearing it down. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They've trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Look what happened. Because he destroyed the vineyard, what happens to his heritage? What happens to the church there? It becomes a wilderness. Well, read your Bible. Do you know what lives in the wilderness? Scorpions, serpents, dragons, beasts. That's what comes in. That's what happens. God said, uh, who was it that wrote this? He said, here's my, I got my vineyard, built a nice wall around it, did everything I could. I think it was Solomon. And he said he went by the vineyard. Thistles had grown up. The wall had been breached. It had been torn down. And he said, I got wisdom from that. I looked at that and I saw that. That was a vineyard that was left unkept. Somebody didn't tend to it. Somebody didn't take care of it. Somebody... Decided they didn't need it anymore and they left it. And we know what happens. Nature just takes over, doesn't it? Think about that for a while. Think about your nature climbing back in to take over your life. When you don't care about the vineyard anymore. And then he says in verse 13, They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. That is almost identical to what God said to Adam. Adam, you'll sow but the ground is cursed. It's going to yield thorns and thistles. That ground is cursed. Where did we come from? Ground. We're cursed right along with it. And we are a reflection of this earth, of the dirt that we came from. Just as good seed can be sown into us, it's the abundance of thorns, the abundance of thistles, the abundance of sin chokes the word of God out. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. And they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. One of the reasons why we cannot find churches anymore that'll 
hold to the word of God. Hosea chapter 8, turn, there, turn to Hosea. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Verse 7, for they have sown the wind. What do you think that means? They have sown the wind. What do you think that refers to? Let me hear your wisdom on it. Anybody? Just blowing air. Huh? Hot air. It's kind of what it sounds like. When they talk about the Spirit of God, and I, I read this uh, last weekend, uh, last Saturday, I spent a little, a little time going through the Bible showing you that when the Spirit shows up, He speaks. He has words to say. He's the one that was the Spirit that was in Christ when He stood and opened the book in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach. Not to dance, not to, uh, to bring some sort of excitement atmosphere with the music and the dark lights and the fog machines and all that stuff. Not to do that stuff. God, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach. And you have people saying that when the Spirit of the Lord comes on them, they can't speak, they can't talk, they, they, they feel this elevation in their flesh but there's no words there there's no doctrine there's no teaching churches that say well we're not about doctrine we're about love and they want to act like they don't believe anything or that doctrine is not important doctrine is everything if you don't believe right you're not going if you don't believe what god said and god's word is doctrine so they have sown the wind they shall reap the whirlwind. We all know what that is. Hurricanes, tornadoes. Picture of the, I guess, the Antichrist. The whirlwind coming. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. And then uh, turn to Hosea 10. Well, there's a lot in Hosea I could spend time on. I have verse 13 up on the screen, but look at verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. When Jesus walked by a tree that was supposed to bear fruit and it didn't have any fruit, what did he do to it? Cursed it. The Bible says that that tree withered that day. That's a powerful curse. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Talking about idols. Look at verse 2. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. For now shall they, they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Uh, let's go on down to have verse 13 up to the screen, but look at verse. Uh, oh, let's go to verse 9. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Look at what God said in verse 10. It is in my desire that I should chastise them. And the people shall be gathered against them, and they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. God wants to chastise them. Israel won't have it. And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn, but I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plow and Jacob shall break his clods. Then verse 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Sow to yourself in righteousness. If you live a clean life, you won't be making a lot of apologies. If you live a decent life, there aren't a lot of things to be sorry for. And that's what he means. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Sow to yourself the word of God. Read that Bible. Listen to that Bible. Some people don't read very well, so 
Get them a copy of um, the Word of God read by Alexander Scorby. Greatest reading of the Bible that I've ever heard. Um, I think we have that available. If you, if you want a copy of it, come see me. Uh, but sow to yourself the Word of God. Sow so in prayer. Supplications. Asking God for help. Asking God to help you. Asking God to help others. Sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. But He said in verse 13, You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. Notice that He said, You have eaten the fruit of lies. What does that sound like to you? Genesis 3. Look at Genesis 3. Here's the fruit of lies. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, He deliberately lied, Ye shall not surely die. And again, I make the point, you'll never see or hear Satan telling, commanding Eve. I want to say he didn't even suggest it to her, but we know he's tempting her for that reason. But he at no point did he ever say, go ahead and eat it. That was all Eve. Every bit of that was her. Every bit of that was us. Yeah, the devil's going to be tormented for eternity for what he's done. But so will all of those who don't trust in Christ. You shall not eat of it, and you shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. They ate the fruit of lies. They ate from the vine of Sodom, the bitter clusters from the vine of Sodom. They ate of it, they partook of it, and now sin reigns. So he said, you've eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. And there's no doubt that the things that we sowed even years ago, we now reap as a result of that. Our lives have all been destroyed by sin in one way or another. And just because you got saved, just because you trusted in Christ, the effects of the sins of the past are always ever present in our lives. And they won't go away until Christ appears in the air and takes us up. Amen? Now Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is an amazing passage in the Bible. It's full of parables and it's full of seed parables in Matthew 13 you have the parable of the seed and the sower you have the parable of the wheat and the tares you have the parable of the mustard seed and I think the uh, the leaven in three measures of meal I think is in Matthew 13 I may be wrong on that one but it's loaded with these teachings that Christ said this is me this is how I this is how I See things. This is how I work. Matthew thirteen eighteen. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. These are people that they've heard verses. Somebody gave him a gospel track. Somebody handed them a preaching CD, DVD. 
sent them an email, posted something online with scripture. Um, people look at it, read it. That sounds good. They move right along. And the devil's right there because their life is so full of sin, because they obey the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, because that spirit is there and always there. Whenever they hear the word of God, whenever the word of God is given to them in some form, some fashion, Satan immediately takes it away from them, removes it from them. So it has no chance of taking, taking root whatsoever. I preached a message uh, a couple years ago, went down to Harrison, Arkansas. God laid it on my heart to preach this down there and we have it online, have it available. Uh, I think it's called um, Satan's Biggest Enemy. And his biggest number one enemy is the words that are in this book. He hates this book. He is afraid of this book. He can't stand to be in the presence of this book. And our Savior, when he was tempted, gave him the words out of this book. And that made him leave. And if you've ever got the devil on your tail... Open up this book on him. He'll, he may try for a while, but Jesus said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that is exactly what happens. But this is a person's life. They receive the word of God. It's cast over toward them. The devil takes it away immediately. He, he eats it. He consumes it so that nobody can have it. The devil has been in the Bible destroying business forever. Man, don't seem like I've been preaching long. Um, we'll pick this back up next Sunday, but contemplate. Think about God's word and the effect that it has in your life. And I'm going to say this. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people, heard a lot of preachers say the word must be applied. Yeah, in a way, I believe that. But I think importantly, first, the word must be believed. Believe it. The word is alive. It's powerful. And it will do things in you that you don't think could be done. The word of God made a four-day-old dead Lazarus come to life. All Jesus did was say, Lazarus, come forth. And the power of his word overcame the corruption that had already fixed itself on Lazarus' body. And he walked out of that tomb alive. Whew. I think if I was Lazarus, I don't think I'd ever have a sad day after that. I think I'd just be leaping for joy every day. Going around telling everybody, let me tell you about how, did you know I used to be dead? Amen. Father, this word, I know what it is. I know the power it has. I know the devil hates it. I know the devil tries to get me pulled away every day from this book. He fears it. He knows that it has power. He knows that it conquers him. And however many devils he has on his side, it conquers and destroys every one of them. When Jesus comes back, he comes back as the word of God. And he'll reign as the word of God on this, on this earth. So Father, we thank you for what a precious book this is. I thank you, God, for its marvelous work. I thank you, God, for what it has done in my life and in my family and in this church. And Father, all these people, Lord, that are watching today and listening, they're not listening because it's me. They're listening because of this book. And Father, we give honor and praise to your word and we love it. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Read your Bible.